Welcome back to Anatomy and Physiology on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. In this video, we're going to go over a fairly complicated topic in anatomy and physiology, and that is the lumbar plexus. We want to really understand here uh, the various nerve roots that contribute to specific nerves, and then really the focus here is going to be uh, to classify those nerves of the lumbar plexus and, in general, what muscles they innervate. Uh, we're going to see one of these that's purely sensory, and a lot of these also have other sensory functions, but we really are not going to be focusing on the sensory functions of these nerves, really the motor function. Sensory will be in a separate video. So first of all, what is the lumbar plexus? Well, the lumbar plexus consists of ventral rami of the spinal nerves really between L1 and L4. Now, two things about this. One, this L4 nerve root also is involved in the sacral plexus. So this is kind of the bridge right here between the lumbar plexus, which is right here, and the sacral plexus, which actually begins at L4 and then runs down to S3. We'll cover that in the following video. The second thing is that notice here we have a small contribution from T12, the ventral ramus of the spinal nerve root T12. However, it's a minor contribution to the lumbar plexus, and so for that reason, generally speaking, we'll just say that the lumbar plexus is L1 through L4. And again, a very important thing to remember is these are the ventral rami, not the dorsal rami, and not even the spinal nerves themselves. They are the ventral rami. Now let's begin by looking at this T12 nerve root. Now this technically is not a part of the lumbar plexus, but it does have a small contribution uh, to these first two nerves right here. Okay? But in general, the ventral ramus of T12 actually forms what we call the subcostal nerve. The subcostal nerve actually plays a role in innervating some of the abdominal muscles, but we'll see that in a future playlist. So subcostal nerve is just the ventral ramus of T12. Now for these first two nerves, which are a part of the lumbar plexus. The first one is the iliohypogastric nerve, and the second one is the ilioinguinal nerve. You'll notice that if you follow these black lines back, both the iliohypogastric and ilioinguinal nerves actually originate from the same common point right here. And if we follow this yellow line back, we see that that's actually the L1 ventral ramus. Okay? So iliohypogastric and ilioinguinal, we say, have contributions really only from L1. Now, there are going to be minor contributions from T12 because notice this uh, common branch right here actually has some T12 contribution to it. Okay? But generally speaking, iliohypogastric and ilioinguinal, if you look these up, it'll just say L1. All right? So pretty straightforward. Now, iliohypogastric nerve is going to innervate abdominal muscles, just like ilioinguinal. There's a little bit of difference between these. Iliohypogastric is mainly going to get the internal obliques and the transversus abdominis. Ilioinguinal nerve is going to get the internal and external obliques and transverse abdominis. Now, uh, a word of caution about this. Uh, you may see some differences in the muscles that are innervated by these uh, depending on what source you're looking at. Okay, so it's very important just to understand here the general innervation. These two innervate abdominal muscles in the anterior abdominal wall. Okay, so once we get past those two and we get down to genital, femoral, and below, these start innervating structures in the pelvic cavity and the lower extremities. So the next nerve in sequence is the genitofemoral nerve. Now, you won't really talk too much about this nerve. Um, you can see if you follow this uh, root back, it's actually going to get contributions from both the L1 ventral ramus and the L2 ventral ramus, these two. And so we say the genitofemoral nerve is L1 to L2. Now, this nerve does not innervate any common muscles that we generally talk about. It's going to innervate actually two muscles that are involved in regulating the temperature of sperm cells in males. And these are the cremaster and dardos muscles. Again, those are some we'll talk about more in a future playlist. But it suffices to say these are two muscles that males have, and they actually help draw the testicles up more closer to the body, and that increases their warmth if you're in a cold environment. If it's a warm environment, they relax. Okay? But the genitofemoral nerve provides innervation to these two muscles. Now we get to one that's purely sensory. This is the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve. Now by the name, this tells us it's sensory. 
How do we know that? Because it has the word cutaneous in it. If we have a cutaneous nerve, generally speaking, those are all sensory. Okay? They're not mixed, they're not motor, they are sensory by definition. And so it also tells us that it innervates or provides sensation on the lateral aspect of the thigh. Femoral refers to the thigh. So on the lateral aspect of the thigh, this nerve relays sensory information back to the CNS, central nervous system. And if we follow this route back, we can see that it gets contributions from L2 ventral ramus, right here, and then also the L3 ventral ramus. So we say lateral femoral cutaneous nerve is L2 and L3. Now for some more complicated ones. Uh, these are the femoral nerve and the obturator nerve. Now, the nice thing about these when you're learning them is they both have the same roots. If we follow any of these back, we're going to see that they get contributions from L2 ventral ramus, L3 ventral ramus, and L4 ventral ramus. They're the same in terms of that. The other important thing about the femoral and obturator nerves, other than having the same nerve root contributions, is they both have this bifurcation right here. And they bifurcate into an anterior branch and a posterior branch. Notice they both do this. Another thing that's common between them is that before that bifurcation, they give off at least one muscular branch. So a minor branch that's going to some muscle. So let's take a look at those now. First, the femoral nerve. Now, this tells you that it should be innervating muscles near the femur, so in the thigh, and that's exactly what it does. Now, notice the femoral nerve is going to bifurcate into an anterior and a posterior branch, but before it does, it gives off two minor muscular branches, one to iliacus, which is a hip flexor, part of iliopsoas, and then another muscular branch to pectineus. Pectineus is, is one of our AD ductors, but it's sometimes not classified with the AD ductors, right? Now, it's important to remember that iliacus out of the iliopsoas is the only one that's actually innervated by the femoral nerve, okay? Um, psoas major actually has a different innervation, and we'll cover that when we cover the hip flexors in more detail. But nerves to iliacus and pectineus branch first. Then we get this bifurcation right here and this branches into the anterior and posterior branches. The anterior branch really hits up sartorius, whereas the posterior branch gets all of the quadriceps. So rectus femoris, vastus lateralis, vastus medialis, vastus intermedius, and articularis genu. It's actually a fifth quadricep muscle. Most people don't know about that one. But all the quadriceps are, are innervated by the posterior branch of the femoral nerve. Okay. Now, obturator nerve follows a similar pattern. It also has contributions from L2 to L4 ventral rami. It also gives off at least one branch. It's only one branch here before it bifurcates, and that's going to be a branch to obturator externus. Obturator externus. Not internus. Obturator internus has its own nerve that actually comes from the sacral plexus. So understand this is externus. Then we get this bifurcation into anterior and posterior branches. Now, the anterior branch of the obturator nerve is going to innervate most of these AD ductors. So AD ductor brevis, adductor longus, gracilis. Okay, these are innervated by the anterior obturator branch, whereas the posterior branch really innervates the adductor magnus. And I specify this here, the adductor part. AD ductor part. That's important to specify because remember the adductor magnus has two parts, an adducting part and a hip extending part, which is a hamstring part. The hamstring part is actually innervated by the sciatic nerve, which we will be covering in the next video. So only the adductor part of adductor magnus is innervated by the posterior branch of the obturator nerve. But if you wanted to really sum up the obturator nerve, okay, yeah, it innervates obturator externus, but it really gets these AD ductors right here, okay? So hopefully that makes sense. Now, one other thing I wanted to cover in this video before we conclude is that the different parts of the, of the lumbar plexus are classified as either anterior or posterior components. Okay, this really has more to do with how they come off of the lumbar plexus. This has nothing to do with what muscles they innervate, okay? and I'll explain why that is in a minute. The anterior parts of the lumbar plexus 
Yeah, we don't really consider a subcostal nerve part of it, but it is anterior. Then we have iliohypogastric, ilioinguinal, genitofemoral, and the obturator nerve. Those are going to be the anterior divisions or anterior parts of the lumbar plexus. Again, that really has more to do with their orientation as they, as they become their own nerves coming off of the lumbar plexus, off of these nerve roots over here. And then the only two posterior ones we have are the femoral nerve and the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve. Those are the only uh, posterior ones. And the reason why I wanted to specify that this anterior posterior has nothing to do with what muscles they innervate is because notice the femoral nerve is a posterior division of the lumbar plexus but yet it innervates muscles that we clearly know are anterior. Your quadriceps are right on the anterior thigh, so is the sartorius. So this po posterior versus anterior has nothing to do with the muscles that they innervate. It only has to do with their orientation as they emerge from those uh, ventral rami of the lumbar plexus. Okay. Now leading into the next video over the sacral plexus, notice here we have this branch that's coming off of the L4 ventral ramus, and that's the lumbosacral trunk. Okay? The lumbosacral trunk is a communication between the lumbar plexus and the sacral plexus. And so if we look at this picture right here, here's our L4 ventral ramus, and we see the lumbosacral trunk coming off of that. And it'll actually communicate really with the superior gluteal nerve. But really what the lumbosacral trunk does is it provides a communication, a network between the lumbar and the sacral plexuses. And so what we can actually do is we can call them collectively the lumbosacral plexus. Although in my opinion, it's easier to learn them separately and then learn after that that we have a communicating branch that goes between them to create one unified network. So hopefully this video gave you a good understanding of the lumbar plexus. In the next video, we'll be discussing the structure of the sacral plexus. Join us then. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you.